Hi, everyone. My name is Teodor Dimitrov, and I'm working in IT Hub Kaufland. And I'm here today to share a talk with you. And the talk is called Vertical Scaling with Spring WebWorks. So what are we going to talk about today? How we can use our current uh, resources on our web servers more efficiently, how we can save up on building expensive clusters. And one of the reasons I chose this topic is because it's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed playing with it. So I'll show you my knowledge about it. So let's talk about the agenda. First, I'm going to introduce myself. Then we're going to play a game called the Pizza Manager game. So if there are any managers in the room, that would be really helpful. If there are only developers, even better. Uh, then we're going to speak about non-blocking technologies. And we're going to do a benchmark at the end to compare Spring MVC, Spring WebWorks, which framework, which module is performing better, and which one is performing worse in which scenarios. So a few things about me. As I've mentioned, my name is Teodor Dimitrov. I work for IT Help Kaufland for two and a half years. Normally, I'm a full stack developer. I use frameworks like Spring, Angular, all kinds of relational databases. And for the past six months, I'm leading a couple of the teams in the hub. So I'm focusing on building scalable teams, not only scalable applications. We're going to talk a lot about scaling today. And one other thing that's really interesting, my team and I, we really care about education, so building an internship program from scratch. We are starting sort of an academy next year, so a lot of interesting stuff I'm involved in. And that's all. Let's move to the, like, to the talk. That's the most important part. So we're going to play a game called the Pizza Manager. It's good that the lunch break is in a few hours, so if someone gets hungry, yeah, there will be pizza, I guess. So uh, are there any managers in the room? Any managers? No hands up? Ah, yeah, one manager. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> are there any Spring developers? Spring developers? Yeah, you're on the right place. Oh, cool. Let's see who will give better answers, the managers or the developers. That's always interesting. I love this part. So here is our scenario. We have a place that's called Pizza Block. And it's basically a small pizza restaurant. And we have only two employees there. And one old one, of course. We need to bake the pizza. And let's see what is happening in this restaurant and if we can uh, solve some of the problems, if there are any problems. So normally in this restaurant, when a customer arrives, the first employee will serve the customer, take its pizza order, and put it in the oven. And normally, we need five minutes to bake the pizza in the oven. So during that period of time, the employee is staying next to the oven and waiting for the pizza to get done. If another customer arrives, the second employee will handle the next customer, go to the, pizza, to the oven with the pizza, and wait for another five minutes. So far, so good. No problems. But new customers are coming in our restaurant, and they might want some, or something to order. For example, a new pizza, a Coke, whatever it is. But our employees are staying next to the oven, waiting for the first pizzas to get baked. So they're not really doing anything. And in this case, no orders can be taken further. So do you have any suggestions how we can fix this? Any brave people to share their opinion? Yeah? Hire more, hire more employees. OK, that's a good suggestion. Thank you for that. Uh, are you a developer? Oh, good. <laughs> OK, any other suggestions? Yes? Ah, OK, that's a good answer. One guy only taking the orders, the other guy making the pizzas. That's a really good question. Any other suggestions? So I can show mine then. They are very similar to what you've said. So thank you for uh, what your suggestions. They were really good. Uh, but I found out there are mostly three solutions that can do the job. The first one is to hire another employee, as you suggested. That's a really good suggestion. So one of the guys can go to the next employee. The next employee will take the, the order, and we can go on. But this approach is a bit of expensive. We cannot have indefinitely employees. We cannot have, like, 200 employees in this restaurant. That's too expensive. And pretty much, we cannot have an employee for every single customer. 
So that will solve the problem partially. But there might be other better solutions that are targeting the problem directly. Another solution would be to open another restaurant, right? So two more employees in the, in the other restaurant, so no customers are waiting for their pizzas. The process is really smooth. We are all happy. We are making revenue. Yeah, but the thing is that we cannot open so many restaurants all the time. We have customers to serve. And really, we are not targeting the main problem that our two employees are blocked and waiting for the pizza to get baked. So the third solution is really like the easiest one. And it is, let's wait for the oven to tell us when the pizza is baked. And meanwhile, our employees can take other orders. So no one is really blocked. In this case, if we don't stay next to the oven, the next customers can be served by the same employees. And that's actually a really efficient way to organize this problem. Not much of a hustle there. But let's see what is really happening when we're building web applications. Which of those solutions do we choose when we face similar problems? And that's on the interesting part. So in the next part, I'm going to talk about non-blocking operations. That's really interesting. And Let's see how our Spring Boot applications are normally working, what are the default settings, and what we are actually doing when we face concurrency issues. So in this scenario, it's very similar to the pizza block. We have two threads uh, in a thread pool, only two threads, just for the scenario. And we have a database, a database layer, which takes up to two seconds to get the data back. So what is really happening? An HTTP request is coming. And the first thread, the first worker, will take this HTTP request, go to the database, and wait for two seconds to return all the data. This is the classical request per thread approach. And the default Tomcat server in Spring, Be Spring, Web, uh, Spring Boot is working exactly like this. So if another HTTP request arrives, the same thing is happening. It goes to the database, wait for two seconds to get the data back, and just waiting. So if a third request arrives, well, we have a problem because there are no more workers to serve that threat. And in this situation, if we go back to the pizza block example, there are really a couple of things we can do. We can add more threads. Normally in Tomcat, we have a default setting of 200 threads working in a pool. That's OK. But if we increase that, we might hit some performance issue because each thread has its own stack. It consumes memory. So if we are not careful enough and working with a lot of data, we can blow the heap. So we have to be careful when we're increasing the threads. <clears throat> so that's not a silver bullet, what I'm saying. Uh, we can, of course, if we have some sort of a cloud infrastructure, we can just create more pods in our cluster. We can enhance our cluster. That, of course, is expensive in some cases. In some cases, not so much. But again, we are spending some, some money. But the thing that we are not really doing in this case is optimizing the way our threads are working, our workers. So one solution to that are non-blocking operations. So let's continue this scenario. When the data is back, we return an HTTP response, pretty cool, and the next HTTP request can be handled. So we have this blocking state of two seconds. And the second worker is behaving exactly the same way. In two seconds, it will return the response. Okay. So what is the alternative? What are non-blocking applications doing better? Let's see. Again, the same scenario. We have a thread pool with two workers and a database, which again takes two seconds to return the data. But let's see what is happening in this case. An HTTP request is coming. And the worker is going again to the database to execute some sort of a query. But this time, it is registering a callback and the database will call him back when it gets the data collected. So meanwhile, our first worker can handle another request. And the next request might not be related to going to the database and do some expensive operation. It might be something much faster. So uh, this thread will take two jobs, getting the data from the database and serving whatever the next HTTP request wants him to do. And when the data is collected, when we have all the data, we get the HTTP response back. So that's pretty cool. 
And the second worker will behave the same way. It goes to the database, but it's not blocked by the database. Instead of that, it can do something else until the data is returned. And this, by, this, by using this, we can get more concurrent requests, so we can scale up. We can uh, use more efficiently our threads, and we don't have to enhance our hardware. We can just go with it. I will show you how in the demo, of course. So the way to achieve this in a Spring environment is called Spring WebWorks. It's a new module, an alternative to Spring MVC. And if we compare both stacks, we'll see some differences. Normally in Spring MVC, how many of you work with Spring MVC? Probably a lot of people. Yeah, I do it all the time. So we have REST controllers, we all know them, easy way to build APIs. We have a servlet API, which is a blocking API. Of course, we have servlet 3.1, which has async support. We have deferred result, completable features, but in general, servlet API is a blocking one. And normally we have Tomcat or some other enterprise server. And all those stuff are working in a synchronous way, in a blocking way. With Spring WebWorks, things are a little bit different. We still have our REST controllers, which is pretty cool. So when we switch from Spring MVC to Spring WebWorks, we can use the same code style that we, we are used to it with Spring MVC. But we have one new thing called router functions. I will show them how to build router functions in the demo. But router functions are a more functional way of building endpoints. And it looks very good, in my opinion. But let's see. And here we have, we don't have a servlet API. We're using reactive streams. So we're going to talk a little bit about reactive and how FFox is using reactive on its way. And down here we have Netty. Netty is a non-blocking server, so this is one of the biggest differences in this stack. Uh, of course, Tomcat and Jetty can work in a non-blocking manner as well, but Netty is like the most popular non-blocking server right now. So in order to understand how this non-blocking concept is working, let's take a better look at Netty and what is Netty doing to get us there. The first most important thing about having non-blocking operation is the event loop. So let's take a look at this scenario. We have a couple of HTTP requests, which are calling some external uh, APIs, like going to the database, calling external API, external endpoints, uh, using the file system in some way. And in between, there is a single event loop. And the event loop has, is it's a single thread that is always listening for new tasks and executing them in the following way. It's registering a callback to some of the external APIs. And when the data is collected, returned on whatever job the external API has to do, it is calling back that the operation is completed, and we get the response back. And the way Netty is using this is with a couple of event loops. If you all know Node.js, Node.js is using a single event loop for dispatching all the requests. It's very efficient, so Netty is doing something very similar. Uh, our event loops in Netty are grouped in uh, event groups. And we have one special event group, which is called the boss event group. That's like the manager of Netty. And there is a single thread, single event loop, that is doing only one job, dispatching requests. So whenever a new request arrives, this boss event loop will just dispatch it to some of the worker event loops that we'll see in a moment. Only this. And then, of course, we have another group called the worker event group. And we have some amount of event loops there, normally not that many. Uh, for example, in my machine, I have four CPUs. And I think due to hyper-threading, I have eight event loops, uh, eight processors in general. So I have only eight threads doing all the job. And we cannot get below four, I, get, I, I believe. I read it somewhere in the documentation. So you can, you can go with at least four event loops and go up to eight, 12, but not that many, event, uh, that, that many threads. And all those worker event loops, all those threads, they're working in different channels. That's happening on the native layer. And in every channel, we have stuff like channel inbound, outbound handler. We have channel future for doing all the async tasks. But the important thing to remember here is that each worker works in different channels. If we have a blocking operation, then one event whoop, we use only one channel. And normally, we don't want to have blocking operations in our non-blocking servers. We'll see why. 
well, actually, I can tell you why <laughs> right now. Because uh, since we have only a handful of threads, and if we block all of them, we can block the complete server. So that's no good. And Webflux is using something called Reactor, which is uh, following the Reactor specification. And we have a couple of interesting interfaces, which, of course, going to see in the demo. But mostly we have a publisher and we have a subscriber. So as you can tell, the subscriber is subscribing to the publisher. And then the publisher is returning data back to the subscriber. We can have many subscribers for a single publisher. And that's called, that's called a stream. So that's really a simple um, design pattern. But we have one, something very important in Reactor. We have a third interface called subscription. And in this subscription, we have a method. We have two methods there, but one of them is really important. It's called request. And with this request method, we can set back pressure. And back pressure is telling the publisher that I cannot take any more data. You need to slow down. So we can, we, we can specify the rate at which we are getting data. So this is sort of a slow down mechanism. And database drivers are not part of Netty and Webflux. But they're really important because we, we are, we, it's not a good idea to have a blocking dependency like JDBC, for example. Uh, currently, there are reactive drivers for uh, NoSQL databases, but now they're building reactive drivers for uh, typical relation databases. One noticeable absence here is Oracle, of course. No, re no reactive driver for Oracle. I guess that's life. But we have pretty good reactive drivers for PostgreSQL, MySQL, My SQL Server. That's yeah, so what's cool. We're going to use MySQL in my demo. And the reason why we don't want to have JDBC, the, the good old JDBC driver, is because it's blocking. It will block our threads. And it doesn't make sense to have a non-blocking server with blocking dependencies. So we really have to care about the reactive drivers. And I think uh, before I jump to the demo, I want to show you how I prepared the benchmark. So we're going to have a little battle here, Spring MVC versus Spring Webflux. So this is a scenario. I have 1,000 concurrent users hitting Spring Webflux application and Spring MVC application. And the interesting part is that my two applications are calling to an external API, which is kind of slow. It takes two seconds to return all of the data. And let's take a look at the results. I'm going to do the same benchmark with 400 users because my Mac tends to crash with that much of a load. I don't want this to happen. So let's see what is happening with 1,000 users. Uh, this is the setup of the benchmark. I'm using JMeter, which also tends to crash, but that's another topic. So in the first 10 seconds, I'm reaching 1,000 concurrent users, uh, 200 each two seconds. And for the next 15 seconds, there is a constant low of 1,000 concurrent users. And let's take a look over the results. So with Spring MVC, at the beginning, uh, we have a response time of two seconds, which is pretty normal because the external API needs two seconds to reply. But when the users are increasing, the response time is slowing rapidly. So we get up to 10 seconds. And on average, we get eight seconds. So we need eight seconds for 25 seconds to serve 1,000 concurrent users hitting the application each second. And with Spring Webflux, we are also studying a two seconds response time. But the response time goes only up to four seconds. So this is almost twice as faster. And on average, I got 3.6 seconds, which is not great, not terrible. Not, I think I got it wrong, but yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the only thing that really matters um, is that how many requests we are able to serve each second. So we are able to serve with Spring MVC only 97 requests per second. And something really important here, of course, the laser is not working, but we cannot go above 200 requests per second because we have only 200 threads serving the requests. So we, we can never exceed this limit unless we increase the thread pool. And here with Spring Webflux, we have only eight threads, not 200, only eight. And during some part of the applications, 
we are able to serve 500 requests per second. So that's two and a half times more. And on average, we get 220 requests served per second. So let's do this benchmark right now. And I'm going to show you the applications. How do they look like? Yep. So let's go to IntelliJ. I will zoom in. So this is my blocking application. As you can see, nothing new here. I'm using Spring Boot Starter. So this is the classical Spring game we see. And of course, I'm using Lombok because, because it's Java, not Kotlin. So I don't need boilerplate code. So, but in general, this is the classical Spring game we see thing. And I have only one endpoint, which is this get mapping. So I have this data model, which has ID name and a price which for some reason is double, that doesn't matter. Um, and we have this endpoint that is using the good old REST template, and the people those guys say that the REST template is gonna be deprecated sometime soon, so we're gonna use the new thing in Webflux, which is called Web Client. We're gonna see it in a moment. But what we are doing here is, we are calling this external API, which is another JSON server, working on localhost 3000, and it takes two seconds to return the data, so it's a little bit of a slow. We have all that, those external APIs that are slow, we, we cannot do anything about them, so this is one of them. And yep, it's a simple get request. I think the port is 8081. So let's call it to see what will happen. Ah, it's not started, okay. So I need to start the application as well. Yep, we're ready to go. So it takes, again, two seconds to return the data because of the slow third-party API. And let's test it with JMeter. Sometimes JMeter crash, so don't be surprised if that happens right now. Uh, let's see the first the setup. This is the same thing. I think I need to press command option and eight. So this is the same setup, but with less concurrent users, only 400, not 1,000. And again, I'm reaching 400 users in the first 10 seconds, and I get a constant load in the next 15 seconds after that. Uh, let's see. And I will call the Spring MVC application just to see what will happen. Probably I will zoom in a moment. Hmm. Yeah, I will zoom after the benchmark is done. So right now 400 users are hitting my Spring MVC application and I cannot get more than 200 requests served per second. So some threads are blocked, then they're not blocked anymore, so they can handle more work, so it goes up and down. And what I get at the end, huh, is a response time of two seconds at the beginning, then it goes up to four seconds, so that's, let's see how much on average is that. So on average, 3.5 seconds. And we're able to serve around 90 requests per second. Not bad. Now let's see the Spring Webflux application. How does it look like? I will start with the POM XML file, of course. So what we have here is Spring Webflux, no Spring MVC at all. Lombok again, just to clear the code a bit. So that's it, really, nothing more than that. And I have the same entity, but this time I'm using the web client uh, and calling the same API, but this time 
I'm not returning a collection of pizzas. I'm returning a publisher. So this is part of the reactor. We have two publishers in Spring Web Fox. We have a Fox and a Mono. So Fox is returning many results, while Mono will return only a single result. So I can replace this with a Fox. So Mono is for zero or one results. Fox is for many results. That's the most basic explanation. And again, I'm calling the same API. And there is something called body to flux. So I'm transferring, so I'm transforming data back to pizza. And let's start it. Yep, that started even quicker. So let's go back to JMeter. I'm going to clear the results of the previous benchmark. And the only thing I'm going to change is the endpoint and the port because uh, my WebFox application is listening on port 882. Again, returning the same data, doing exactly the same job. Mm -hmm. So let's start it and see what is happening. Abs absolutely the same benchmark here. So we have 400 users, and some of the seconds we are able to serve 200, 315, 310 requests. So in general, probably we can get it from the graph. We can serve many more requests with Spring Web Fox. Uh, and let's see the, the response time. So the response time is two seconds. It doesn't go more than that. And the reason for it is that we are not blocking the threads. They are free. They are not blocked until the data is returned from the external API. So the, here are only eight threads doing the job, and we can see this in the logs. I will zoom them. So this is all of the threads that are doing the job. I said I have eight threads, so you can see the number here: four, three, one. There should be eight somewhere, probably. Yeah, but there are no more than eight threads getting the job done. Okay, so that's cool. Let's quickly go back to the presentation. I have another quick demo prepared. Yeah, where is it? Yeah. So that was an interesting benchmark, but at the end, um, how do we build applications like that and what are the trade-offs for having this improved concurrency. Uh, I have a workshop with my team at, one half, at half past one in hall one. I have no idea where that is, but we will go there. And uh, everybody is welcome to join this workshop, so we're going to build applications like this from scratch. Uh, here I don't have the time to do this, but I can show you a, a simple application, how does it look like, and probably one cool feature. Let's go to, to another project. So this is a basic Spring Web Fox project. And let's see how things are looking like. So if I start with the POM XML file, nope. I'm using Spring Boot Starter Data L2DBC. So this is something right from the kitchen. Right now, the support for relational databases is still in progress. So people are, in people are still developing this. So it's experimental, but it's pretty cool. So we have Spring Data, which is for reactive databases, well, for reactive drivers, for reactive approach. We have with Spring Web Fox. And we, I have a driver for MySQL, which is a reactive driver. It's not the JDBC driver. So that's the biggest change here. But at the end, the code looks very similar to what we have in Spring MVC. Again, I'm um, providing my username and password. Of course, not very secure, as always. And I'm using the RTDBC driver, no JDBC here. So let's take a look at the code. Huh, we have a main class, a main method, which is starting the application. And uh, we have to enable the relational repositories. They are still experimental. So we have to do this uh, in order to get them working. 
And we have an entity called pizza. That's actually an entity. We don't have Hibernate for, uh, reactive, uh, for the reactive approach with the relational databases. We're all used to using Hibernate with the entity annotation and uh, managing the relationships. We still don't have that here, but we can say what's going to be the table. Uh, we can say what, is, what will be the ID. In this case, that's pretty standard. And what we have here is a repository, but a different one. Our pizza repository is extending the reactive code repository, so this is not a blocking repository. It's doing things um, in a non-blocking manner, so that's the new thing. And we have two, approach, two approaches to build our uh, APIs. As I said, the first one looks uh, very familiar to you because it's the controller approach. We have, we have a controller. Let's take a look at the get mapping method here. So we have a method that's returning all of the pizzas. Oh, that's from the previous demo. We have to delete this. We haven't seen it. Um, so we have a get mapping, and instead of array of pizzas or list of pizzas, we are returning flux, which is a publisher, and we are calling the pizza repository. I'm doing some mapping with the result, which we can totally ignore right now. So things are looking pretty much the same way. So if you pref we are used to this style of coding, we can still practice it. It works perfectly. Uh, we have request bodies, path variables, all the easy annotations there. But there are one other approach. Ah, I forgot to mention, we have reactive transaction support, which is pretty cool. But let's take a look over the other way to do things, which is with router functions. Router functions, in my opinion, looks a little bit cleaner. But in this case, let's take a look at the code, what is happening here. So we have an API, which is API pizzas. And most of my endpoints will accept JSON. So I'm defining this for all of the routes below. I'm nesting them. And of course, I can have get, post, put, all kind of HTTP methods here. And there is a handler, another controller this time, a handler which will do all the hard work behind this path. One cool thing that I will show in a moment is streaming. Since we'll talk about reactive streams, we have to show the streaming. Um, but let's first take a look over the handler. So for example, this one will be the handler for getting all the pizzas from the repository. I'm still calling the pizza repository, find all method, which is returning flux of pizza. And then I would return something called server response and pass the pizza flux in the server response. So web folks will handle the rest of it. The important thing here is that we always have to return some publishers. And I've said a few things about streaming. I think it's pretty nice to see this. So we have something called streaming data. And this time, again, I'm going to call find, find all repository. I'm doing some mapping with the pizzas. I think I'm adding VAT, just an example. Uh, and since my database is not really slow, I will slow it intentionally. I've added. Uh, delay elements duration of one second, so I will delay each element on the stream for one second just to see what is happening on, in the browser. And this time I'm not returning JSON, I'm t returning text event stream. So let's try this one. And let's see what will happen in the browser. Yeah, the application started quickly. So if I use the find all method, which is not streaming data but returning JSON, of course you will get this result. But if I call the stream, probably it's stream all, let's see. Yeah. Did I get the path wrong? Yeah, let's check it one more time. So I gave API pizzas stream. Yep, 
Yeah, the port is different. Ah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't have this part anymore. Yeah, that's the other application for the benchmark, of course. And I, I have API in this case. Yep. So let's wait. And all the data will pop up, delayed by one second, so we can stream it directly to the client. And that's pretty easy to consume with a framework like Angular, for example, because we mostly uh, use Angular at work. So that's pretty easy to consume. And you can stream all kinds of data to various clients. That's very convenient. So let's wrap it up, I think. It's good to have some time for questions before we get to that part. A uh, few things about the trade-offs. So we've seen that uh, we get a better concurrency with Spring WebWorks, but it's not a silver bullet. We have to be really careful with it. Uh, if we have projects that have a lot of blocking dependencies, probably it's not a good idea to use Spring WebWorks because uh, we can block the threads and then uh, there is not much to do actually with the threads. And we have to use it only we have some sort of latency. For example, if the database calls are slow, if the um, third-party API is a bit slow, we, that's a good uh, place to use Spring WebWorks. Uh, two days ago, um, I had the same talk in, with our colleagues in Germany in one conference there, and one student from Harborn University came to me and said, hey, I did exactly the same benchmark, but I didn't get your results. Spring Embassy was much faster. And I said, OK, can I take a look over your code? What did you do there? And he didn't have any delays. So basically, the database was, was were returning the results instantly. So in this case, 200 threads might perform better than eight. So Spring WebFox really shines when there is some sort of a latency where we have some blocking operations in our application layer. But as I said, we have to be really careful. We don't want to block the threads. I think IntelliJ is also helping with that. It's very smart. If you call subscribe or block or any other blocking operation, uh, it will warn you that you should not do this. It's a dangerous job. So the thing is that we have to use WebFox first when we need uh, to improve our concurrency. Uh, it, we, we should not move from Spring MVC to Spring WebFox because it's really, really cool and fancy. There are a lot of cool and fancy stuff, but um, the time to migrate from Spring MVC to Spring WebFox is substantial in my opinion, so we have to be careful with that one. So thank you very much for being here and for everything. <laughs>